Good morning. Um, I'm going to try to summarize four years of research in 40 minutes. Uh, please interrupt at any point. Um, and uh, um, those of you who don't know Tom and Lloyd, beat me up on Saturday. So um, Tom's here. Oh, no, he's not. Lloyd's here. Um, just kidding. Um, so, um, as most of you know, our lab focuses on angiogenesis in the eye, and um, today's uh, presentation, the compass is really about A and B, and in the lab, we have three broad areas, vascular demarcations, intracellular therapy, and drug novel drug delivery using nanoparticles to focus on this condition. Now, um, as you all know, I'm a cornea guy, and we started off 10 years ago in the lab focusing on what keeps the cornea clear. And we found that a molecule known as soluble FLIP or soluble VEGF receptor 1, which is the high uh, affinity receptor for VEGF, was the uh, main mediator of corneal avascularity and that when you deleted it in uh, the mouse, uh, you obtained a spontaneous corneal neovascularization. Um, and the second strand of our work over the last uh, 10 years has been trying to use that insight of what keeps the cornea avascular physiologically as a novel anti-angiogenic by focusing on intracellular pathways. Um, so, today we're going to talk about some novel models of A and B and targeted, uh, not targeted, targeted intracellular therapeutics. Um, this audience is well aware of uh, what happens in A and B with subretinal neovascularization and hemorrhage and the clinical impact. Um, in America, it's the leading cause of blindness. Uh, in worldwide, it's the second leading cause of, uh, actually third uh, behind corneal disease, a uh, leading cause of blindness simply because there's a lot more uh, corneal injury and glaucoma in the uh, African population. Uh, in the United States, uh, there's 10 million patients with AMD. There are more patients with AMD than cancer, not just breast cancer or prostate cancer, but all cancers put together. There's more patients with AMD than all cancers put together. And worldwide, there's 40 million patients blind bilaterally from macular degeneration. And when you consider the state of Utah, we're talking eight times the state of Utah's population. Am I, am I right? Actually, no, more than that. Uh, probably 12 or 15 times the state of Utah's population um, that are blind, uh, worldwide, just from macular degeneration. So it truly is an epidemic. So what happens here? We have choroidal neovascularization, growth of abnormal blood vessels from the retinal space, a uh, subretinal space into the retina destroying vision. And what we wanted uh, to achieve in the last several years is to first understand what normally protects vascular zoning of those photoreceptors. When you think about it, it's quite remarkable that the avascular photoreceptor layer sits adjacent to the highest flow vascular bed in the body. So what controls that vascular zoning is a very important uh, research question. Now, um, mice share a lot of things with humans, but they don't have a macula. Uh, they do have very similar VEGF and VEGF receptors. They do have a similar uh, genome. Um, the retinal architecture uh, is, is quite similar, except for the absence of a macula, because in the mouse, the optic nerve comes right out of the center of the, uh, of the retina. Um, now, I mentioned to you previously S-FLIT1. S-FLIT is the soluble form of VEGF receptor 1. Because it's soluble, it's not membrane-bound. It's floating around in the extracellular space. It thereby acts as a decoy for VEGF, binding it in the extracellular space, essentially suppressing VEGF um, uh, in, in tissues where it's present. So our hypothesis in this 
big question of what controls vascular zoning underneath the retina was if we knock down S-split 1, will we increase free VEGF and induce choroidal angiogenesis? That was our initial starting hypothesis. Now, would that lead to a new model of AMD, which could be better than the traditional laser model or some of the genetic knockout models that already exist was our secondary question. Okay, so that's our purpose. Um, first, is S split present in the retina? Um, these are uh, in situ uh, hybridization images, so basically looking at mRNA. And interestingly enough, uh, S split is present uh, in the RPE, in the inner segment, a little bit in the outer nuclear layer, and um, in the outer plexiform layer at an mRNA level. Uh, you don't see it on the sense control lens, and you don't expect it to. Um, is it decreased in AMD patients relative to normal? So we don't have that many uh, um, human specimens. We only have about 14 AMD uh, specimens compared to about 10 normals. It's a lot easier to get corneal tissue than retinal tissue. Um, but we find suggestive findings that in normal patients or normal retinas, there's significant S-split in the RPE and in the photoreceptor layer but it's decreased in AMD, both by fluorescent staining and by histologic staining. Okay, so we examined using um, three different approaches, knocking down S-split in the mouse at a protein level, a transcriptional level, and a genomic level. So strategy one was injecting uh, S-split antibody or anti-S-split antibody uh, with a subretinal injection. And uh, first we want to check distribution. So if you inject GFP subretinally in the mouse, you do get a lot of GFP expression uh, in the RPE and in the photoreceptor layer. Now doing a subretinal injection in the mouse um, uh, is probably one of the technically the hardest things you can do. I think from an animal perspective, and, and I have to give a lot of credit to my uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Ling Luo, who is a retina surgeon uh, and uh, apparently a mouse retina surgeon as well. Um, when you do that, what happens? You inject anti, uh, S-split antibody, you get significant uh, CMV at the injection site confirmed on both FA and OCT, and uh, we know this is not due to interactions with the membrane foot receptor, that this is directly a result of taking out the soluble receptor because when you inject the antibody in a foot tyrosine kinase knockout animal where the membrane receptor is non-functional because the kinase is not functioning, you get the same phenotype, you get CMV at the site of injection. We know it's not due to interactions with PLGF, uh, which is a, another potential target of foot antibody because PLGF doesn't change. Okay, so that's at the protein level. Strategy two was knocking down S split at a transcriptional level, taking out the mRNA uh, expression of it by a virus, an adeno-associated virus that expresses a ASH RNA, short hairpin RNA. So I'm sure all of you have heard of RNA interference, where if you uh, express double-stranded RNA inside cells, you will selectively delete the target that uh, is cognate to that double-stranded RNA, because in people, mRNA is single-stranded, Double-stranded RNA is generally viral, and cells recognize double-stranded RNA as foreign and destroy any genes that look like that double-stranded RNA. So this is a way of selectively taking out mRNA transcripts by uh, delivering double-stranded RNAs, uh, technical term is shRNAs, into cells. And when you do that, uh, and appropriate controls are uh, nonspecific shRNA, GFP expressed by AAV and PBS, you uh, induce subretinal angiogenesis. So first, we show that we can knock down S-split by this approach. 
um, and not by the controls. And when you inject uh, the test shRNA, you get very vigorous CNV and um, minimal uh, reaction with the controls. Further, not only do you see CNV, but you see increase in free VEGF with the shRNA knockdown of SK1, as you would expect. Compared to the laser model, so let me start. The human CNV patient, you'll see the classic CNV lesion here. The laser model basically is doing a laser to uh, burn a hole in the, in the retina in Brooks membrane and then CNV goes uh, through Brooks membrane at the edges, and it's very different architecturally than the human condition. However, the virus-induced um, CNV, when we knock down a split, much more closely resembles the, the human uh, uh, process. Um, further, laser CNV lasts for about four weeks and starts to regress. The uh, shRNA knockdown of S-split causes progression of CNV and secondary lesions far from the injection site. And this is confirmed histologically compared to the normal mouse. In addition, you do see pigment epithelial detachments, again, unlike with the laser model. Um, in, in human patients, PEDs are fairly common where you have uh, subretinal um, sub RPE fluid, um, and you can observe that in the mouse OCT uh, here and here, and you can see uh, FA negative areas where you have light up with ICG confirming the presence of a PED in the mouse. Mentioned to you uh, that we increased free VEGF and see that here, where the free VEGF level was highly elevated by knockdown of S foot 1. And if you try to do this in a mouse that lacks VEGF in the retina, then how do you achieve that? You achieve that by giving uh, an enzyme called CRE in a VEGF locks animal. VEGF locks means the VEGF gene has locked the uh, flanking sites which the Cre enzyme can remove in a tissue of interest. And so what we're showing here is that when you inject P. Cre, the Cre enzyme, into a vegf locked animal, you're preventing VEGF from going up and you're preventing CNV from occurring. But if you inject the null plasmid, no Cre, you observe the CNV and VEGF elevation. So when you take out VEGF, Trying to take out S foot doesn't do anything. That's what you'd expect. By mechanistically, we're saying knockdown of S foot releases VEGF, causing CNV. And we're, we also show in the TLR3 knockout animal that um, you observe the same phenotype of CNV and VEGF. And so this shRNA effect of inducing CNV by knocking down S foot is not due to TLR3 effects, but it is due to VEGF uh, desequestration. The uh, third strategy in this zone, uh, or this question of zoning, is um, genomic uh, knockdown of S foot. Now, you can, why not make a genetic knockout, you might ask. If you make a genetic knockout of, of FLIT, it's an embryonic leaflet. The mouse doesn't survive. Um, so you, can, you have to make a tissue selective knockout, and you can do that by doing. P. Cre injection, that same Cre enzyme in a flit locks animal, and as you'd expect, S foot goes down and CNV does occur and VEGF does go up. Or you can do some uh, transgenic models. Now, this is probably my favorite slide in the presentation, so let me just spend a few seconds on it. Um, you can avoid the whole trauma of subretinal injection by crossbreeding animals that will express CRE just in certain areas. So there's a VMD CRE uh, promoter. VMD, as you, most of you recall, vitelliform macular dystrophy. So VM, the VMD promoter is specific to RPE cells. 
and you can put a Cree enzyme driven on the VMB promoter, which when expressed in the rose or red mice, normally the rose red mice, all of the cells are red fluorescent. When Cree is expressed, it shows up as green in this rose or red. The, re the red is converted to green by the Cree, and we're confirming that the Cree is expressed just in the RPE. An alternative promoter that we used was IQ75, which is specific to photoreceptors. And so uh, similarly, we're showing Cree expression just in the photoreceptor layer when you cross IQ75 plus rosa. So basically, we're proving that we can express Cree enzymes selectively either in the RPE layer or in the photoreceptor layer. Does that make sense? When you do the VMD Cree cross footlocks to animal, so expressing Cree just in RPE cells, mating those with the footlocks T animal, you see significant areas of CNV scattered throughout the retina, confirmed histologically, confirmed knockdown of uh, FLT expression in, in uh, the, the the hybrid animal compared to the normal, and confirm CNV on transmission electron microscopy. And when you do the ICRE 75 cross foot lock speed animal, again, you knock down uh, S flit in the photoreceptors compared to the control, confirmed on both in situ and uh, in immunohistochemistry. And here, interestingly enough, we don't see classic CNV, but what we believe is happening, this is just from a few weeks ago, this is very uh, preliminary data, what we believe is happening is a model of not CNV but RAP, retinal angiomatous proliferation, where you get the retinal vessels from the inner nuclear layer going down into the photoreceptor layer. So if you recall, at the outset I showed s foot expression not just underneath the photoreceptors, but overlying the photoreceptors. So with the previous knockout, with the VMD Cree cross foot locks, where you knock down S foot in the RPE, vessels grow up. With this knockdown, what we're observing is the vessels go down into the photoreceptor layer from the retinal circulation. And so uh, uh, this, we believe, uh, recapitulates to some degree what's observed in RAP, retinal angiomatous proliferation, which is a variant of AMD. Okay, so summing up that first sector of our work, uh, we can induce CNV uh, targeting RPE and photoreceptors uh, knock, knock by knocking down s flit, which elevates free VEGF. And uh, by doing this in a variety of different methods, we can uh, correlate uh, the mouse phenotype very nicely to the human phenotype. Kay. Our second sector of work is working on intracellular therapeutics. The, the current paradigm of treating uh, macular degeneration is Avast and Lucentis, both of which are extracellular agents. But many vascular endothelial cells have their own VEGF and their own VEGF receptors. And you can imagine if a cell has its own VEGF and its own receptors, it's much like a junkie who's a dealer. <laughs> and um, you have to interrupt that intracellular supply to get at that. Um, so we started off uh, about eight years ago uh, looking at an interesting uh, four amino acid peptide called KDEL, which is an endoplasmic reticulum retention signal. We took a page out of our friends in the AIDS world who found that if you couple stromal derived factor with KDEL, you can actually knock down CXCR4 and thereby um, prevent the receptor that binds HIV blocking HIV entry into uh, macrophages and T cells. So they called that an intracellular chemokine or intrakine. We wanted to do the reverse express an intracellular receptor or interceptor to knock down VEGF expression. So conceptually, um, VEGF will bind surface receptors and induce various signal transduction events. And what we're proposing to do is attach KDEL to an intracellular receptor 
bind VEGF within the endoplasmic reticulum and keep it from ever leaving the endoplasmic reticulum. In the cornea, we were able to show several years ago um, that we could regress corneal neovascularization induced by alkali injury. And I know I'm speeding through the slides in the interest of time, but essentially what we did here was inject a plasma that expressed a subunit of FLIT with KDEL to sequester VEGF after alkali injury and uh, uh, successfully regressed it. And all of this is building up to Paul Bernstein's problem where I believe on Monday afternoons he has an assembly line of patients um, that is quite tragic. Um, this is the current standard of care in our retina colleagues' practice, where we line up patients month after month, giving them an injection into their eyeball. And it's the best we can do, and it's those of you in residency don't recall 10 years ago or 15 years ago when for OCAPs, you have to read about the macular photocoagulation study and destroying the retina. So this is better, but it's not good. And this needs, it needs to be different. Um, so to address that, we're working on a novel drug delivery system. And that takes us into the final sector of our talk, looking at whether a nanoparticle that encapsulates those interceptor expressing plasmas that is coated with RGD, which homes to neovascular tissue. So RGD is a peptide that's selective for alpha V beta 3 integral, which is present on abnormal mu vessels, but not on normal vessels. So this is a way of, uh, this is a guidance system. Okay, it's basically taking an antiangiogenic therapy and putting a, gui a guiding guidance targeting system on it. Um, working uh, uh, with our collaborators, uh, Dr. Campella in Denver, who makes the nanoparticles, um, uh, our combined group showed a few years ago in rats that uh, laser-induced CNV can be suppressed by RGD-targeted nanoparticles, but not by the control nanoparticles. And we wanted to uh, see whether we could observe similar effects in mice and monkeys. So we'll have three species. We're going to skip over the methods. Um, uh, one of the things we've developed in the lab and, and um, is and hope to work with our photographers going forward is um, measuring volume calculations of CNV. So right now, I, my understanding is in clinic, central macular thickness is used for, uh, to assess uh, CNV response to therapy. But we've actually developed a method where we can uh, determine the full volume of a CNV lesion using the spectralis to stack the different slices of um, uh, the CNV in vivo. Traditionally, volumetry in the mouse is done ex vivo after mouse sacrifice. Um, and we can observe a very good correlation with our in vivo volumetric uh, assessment, which will allow us to trend over time response to therapy without sacrificing too many mice. Um, so in that AAV-induced uh, model uh, that I mentioned previously, when you inject first AAV subretinally, you get the CNV lesion. Uh, this is about a month after AAV injection. And then with a single tail vein injection, so not intravitreal, but a tail vein injection in a mouse of these targeted nanoparticles, you can make that CNV lesion go away confirm them with FA and uh, OCT, as opposed to control nanoparticle injections where the lesions progress and increase. <coughs> yeah, so the nanoparticles, uh, we've shown uh, express interceptors for about eight weeks. Um, and when, when, you, when you assess all the different groups, we c you can actually show close to 50% uh, regression with the targeted nanoparticles um, compared to the, which is statistically significant different from the controls. Um, how do I play the video? Okay. You have AVI. Go, go. 
Okay, okay. Um, I was going to show videos, but um, take my word. Uh, this shows a very large CMV lesion on 3D, and it gets flattened out with treatment. Not with the AAV induced model. The laser induced model, you do get stentorization. Um, we've confirmed that the target alpha V beta 3 integrin is present in all different models, but not in the normal eye. So this is showing uh, specificity of the RGD nanoparticle. And that the RGD nanoparticles do home to uh, the CNV lesion, but not to the normal retina. And um, I'm going to skip this slide. Oh, we're running low on time. Um, now, the nice thing uh, at Moran is that we have great research laboratories with a lot of different skill sets. Dave Krizai on, on the third floor has what's called an optometer, which can actually assess nearing visual acuity. How do you assess visual acuity in a mouse? You don't use an eye chart, but you can use the optokinetic nystagmus uh, reflex and see at what grading of stripes the mouse actually responds to those gradings. And that will tell you the spatial resolution that the mouse is able to observe. Now, a normal mouse starts out at about 0.38 after um, uh, CNV induction, and this is uh, in um, the AAV SHX exit RNA model. Uh, what we observe is a knockdown of um, uh, visual acuity, very far down, but this is uh, restored by the RGD nanoparticle treatment. So in white is post injection, uh, in black is pre injection. You observe a knockdown, and a lot of that visual function is restored by the targeted nanoparticles, but not by the controls. In the buffer-treated uh, animals, the visual acuity actually gets worse. Histologically, we can uh, show that the CNV lesions get smaller, and that our treatment with the tail vein injection is not inferior, to use Barbara's favorite term, uh, compared to intravitreal antibody inject, anti-VEGF antibody injection. So we're not using Avastin, but a mouse anti-VEGF antibody injection. Avastin doesn't, isn't supposed to work in a mouse. Um, but uh, we actually believe our systemic therapy uh, is at least equal to our uh, an intravitreal injection of anti-VEGF antibody. Now, the most important stuff I'm going to show you is the monkey work. You can induce CNV in monkeys using laser, and monkeys do have a macula. And when you uh, do laser spots in a monkey and you wait a month, generally they'll progress. And in our control nanoparticles, they progress too. But in the RGD treated nanoparticles, in the monkeys treated with RGD nanoparticles, the CNV lesion for the most part regress. And this is confirmed histologically, and the effects were statistically significant, and this is also confirmed on confocal microscopy. Um, in both mice and monkeys, we did tox evaluations looking at the kidney, lungs, uh, skin, and liver after the nanoparticle injections. Those are the high blood flow tissues of the body, so any systemic uh, drug, uh, I think it would be advisable to look at those uh, organs, and we did not observe any uh, uh, changes uh, histopathologically in these tissues, so we don't believe that these nanoparticles are toxic. They're made out of PLGA, so they degrade to lactic and glycolic acid, which are degraded by the Krebs cycle. So with a single intravenous injection, we can suppress CNV in mice and monkeys uh, we've, we have out to four-week data uh, of CNV suppression. Uh, the nanoparticles themselves deliver interceptors for eight weeks. Uh, we regressed fibrosis, improved vision, no toxicity was observed. So um, 
with that. I know I've covered a lot of things, but I uh, uh, think I've managed to fit it all in in the time. There was supposed to be audio with that. Um, and I've just taken credit for the work of a lot of different people. And I want to highlight uh, some of the main people in my laboratory. Ling Lu, as I mentioned, is the uh, retinal surgeon who does subretinal injections. Uh, Jackie and Bonnie are critical uh, players in the laboratory. Uh, Hero developed the AAV, SHRNAS split. Our collaborators um, across several different institutions, and of course, our, um, our funding agencies. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Be happy to take any questions. Just get those files earlier. Yeah, I think we can make them work. That's what I'm thinking. 